Good afternoon. Welcome to the IPPS Eastern Region Micro Meeting number nine. It is our pleasure to offer two tours of native plant nurseries, both historic Philadelphia growing spaces that play an important role in the city's park system and beyond. Max Blaustein of Greenland Nursery and Dan Feeser of Bartram's Garden. My name is Shelby French. As the propagation manager at Mount Cuba Center in Delaware, a native plant garden, it's very fitting that I'm your moderator for today. I also serve on the Eastern Region Board of Directors as the membership chair. At the conclusion of our presentations, there will be a time for questions for Max and Daniel. Please use the chat box for questions um, and to communicate at any time with IPPS staff or other attendees. At the end of today's session, there will be a time for additional discussion. Um, feel free to hang out, talk about your nursery, ask questions, and Matt and Dan will, or Max and Dan will also be hanging out longer for continued discussion. And finally, this program is being recorded and will be made available on our website next week. Access to previous micro meetings are on demand through our website's video gallery, which can be found under the Media Center tab. Greenland Nursery has operated in Philadelphia's Fairmount Park since the early 1900s. Max Blaustein is an environmental scientist with the City of Philadelphia's Natural Lands Management Team. His work is focused on seed collection and propagation of native plant species for conservation projects that support the ecosystem function and habitat value of the 5,600 acres of natural lands area within the city of Philadelphia. Max has a degree in horticulture from Temple University, worked at the Crohn's Conservatory in Cincinnati, and apprenticed in the greenhouses at the Arnold Arboretum before taking his current role for the city of Philadelphia in 2009. Please join me in welcoming Max. Hey everybody, and thank you for the introduction, Shelby, and thanks to IPPS for giving me the forum to share a little bit about my work here in our program at the City of Philadelphia. Um, I especially uh, appreciate everyone taking time out of their day to watch this presentation. It's a busy time of year for plant folks, so um, yeah, thank you guys for taking the time. Um, so I'll state from the outset that although um, my facility is rather old, it is definitely lacking in the historical significance of uh, our neighbors at Bartram's Garden. So you'll have to wait until the second half of the presentation for any of the real history. Um, so instead, I'm gonna focus with this opportunity to talk to other practitioners. I'm gonna focus really on the nitty gritty of um, our operation, the facilities, and a little bit about our production practices. Um, but first, just a little bit of context about um, the landscapes that we're working in, some of the challenges that we face and, and how my work at the nursery goes to support what is a, a much um, bigger picture. So for some background, we're in the city of Philadelphia proper. Um, the city began acquiring land back in the mid 1800s. Uh, it was fairly forward thinking um, in an effort to protect the water supply for the city from encroaching industrial development. Um, these were mostly large historic estates that abutted the Schuylkill River, um, which runs through the west of the city. And that was really the, the origins of the park system, which then formally came into being in 1867. Uh, in present day, the park system is over 10,000 acres or 11% of the city's land. Uh, so it's one of the bigger park systems, uh, urban park systems in the country. Uh, within those 10,000 plus acres, about 5,600 are what we term the, the natural areas. So these are the spaces um, apart from neighborhood parks and ball fields. These are mostly forested areas. Um, you can see in the map on the left, the darker green spaces are what we term the natural areas. There are larger watershed parks. So you can see that original park section numbered five on the map. And then the remaining parks were acquired over the years and, and mostly um, about our riparian areas. So you can see where we have some, some woods in a, a very highly developed and urbanized area. So many of these spaces could be mistaken for more intact rural forests with um, you know, very large mature native canopies with good species and structural diversity. Um, but the vast majority of these spaces are clearly impacted by humans and fall somewhere 
in the mix between the, the built and the natural environment. Uh, our goal, so I'm part of a team of six employees who are responsible for managing these 5,600 acres. Fortunately, I only have a, a 10 acre nursery to take care of. The other five, unfortunately, have to take care of the rest. Um, but our mission is really to uh, create and manage these landscapes for resiliency, functionality, support diverse uh, plant communities and habitat types to benefit all the wildlife that use them and also to serve obviously as an amenity to the citizens of Philadelphia and the surrounding region. So we do this through a variety of practices, including sort of traditional silvicultural techniques. Um, we do a lot of erosion control, stormwater management. Um, so we maintain a, a live stake coppice bed at the nursery and produce live stakes for uh, managing our riparian areas. We've done some meadow creation and management throughout the city to increase the habitat diversity. We do some direct wildlife management as well, occasionally. So some of the challenges to these goals are uh, pretty extreme pressure from a variety of invasive plants, um, especially vines like you can see here are a persistent problem, especially in a fragmented landscape like ours. Um, increasingly introduction and persistence of invasive insects and diseases like the emerald ash borer and the spotted lanternfly. Uh, overabundance of white-tailed deer, much like the rest of the East Coast. Um, so I'll say that we do have a, a partnership with the USDA who does a managed call once a year trying to reduce the numbers. Um, but because they're not able to do enough over the past 10 years, most of our large restoration projects have included the construction of heavy duty deer exclosure fencing. So we have about a dozen exclosures across the, the natural areas, uh, about 125 acres total inside fencing. And uh, most of those um, exclosures are between five and 25 acres and are just part of our standard practice now. Also, increasingly, the occurrence of extreme weather events are always a challenge, both at the nursery, out in, in the landscapes as well. Um, so obviously, these are indicative of larger and long-term impacts of climate change, which will have significant impacts, um, you know, rain shifts of our native species, uh, rain shifts of non-native and invasive species, emergence of new pests and diseases. So these are big questions that we're just starting to sort of grapple with. Um, and would certainly be interested to talk with other folks about how they're beginning to think about and address the impacts of climate change. But in the short term, these extreme storms are already wreaking havoc on our aging canopy, causing significant canopy loss, which um, often is followed by uh, invasion. Also, they tend to wreak havoc on our many deer exclosures. So we do a lot of deer fence repair these days as well. So with all that in mind, um, I was given the opportunity back in 2009 to help support this work um, by starting to produce plant materials that support our restoration projects. And the city happened to have a historic nursery facility, which you can see here. Um, I haven't been able to find a whole lot of records about the, the days of nursery yore. I know that some of the oldest plans I have date to the early 1900s. We've got some good aerials you can see from 1942 here in the background. Uh, the nursery at one point, you know, was about 40 acres. They had lots of staff. We're growing a variety of ornamental plants, street trees, park trees, and um, you know, went through a few different iterations over time. Um, gradually shrunk over the years, and then at a certain point was essentially walked away from. So when I started in 2009. Uh, the state of affairs at the nursery was somewhat grim. Um, I was gifted with a, a lifetime supply of, of used containers and some pretty derelict structures. So um, the first step was really getting things to basic functionality, getting the uh, infrastructure up and running, you know, uh, utilities online and that sort of thing. I'm still cleaning out those pots, but we're, we're making progress. So the greenhouse is a pretty cool structure. Um, this plan is from 1910 for the propagating house and tool room. Um, it's a nice partially sunken brick structure uh, with a little head house, which they refer to as the tool room. Um, it was originally uh, a steel frame with glass glazing um, 
two raised beds that were heated through a flue that was um, connected to a coal-fired boiler that was in the basement, which you can see in the, the top left of this plan. It was still in the basement when I started long disconnected. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a cool old structure. And at some point, the glass glazing disappeared in a, a former iteration. And one of the previous nursery managers basically built a hoop house over top of the, the brick structure. It's a pretty functional space. I mean, we have um, twin layer poly on there and it, it's fairly functional. It helps us propagate some plants. So it's definitely still a pretty rustic facility. Um, the second building also has some really nice uh, heavy duty masonry cold frames, which we built some simple polycarbonate lights for. Um, these mostly get used for winter storage of young seedlings. They tend to stay pretty, pretty solidly in the, the high 30s, low 40s throughout the winter. So it's a really nice protected space for, for delicate stock. We built a new uh, 20 foot by 72 foot unheated hoop house a number of years ago, which helps for production of young plants and uh, overwinter storage of a lot of these containers. And then we put together just a pretty simple outdoor container growing area. Um, it's about 4,000 square feet with overhead irrigation. As we'll talk about through the process, you'll see that we have a pretty diverse suite of crops. They're pretty small in number. And so um, this is a pretty adaptable space that lets us grow what we need to grow. So the reason to back up a little bit that we are even in existence is because um, you know, this division had been doing restoration work in the park since the late 90s. And in doing so, they began to realize that they weren't often able to source the diversity of species um, that they wanted for these restoration projects. And that also they were not always sure about the provenance of those plant materials. So, they were interested in starting in-house plant production so that we could broaden the suite of native species to be putting back into these natural areas and also be assured that the provenance of the plants themselves were from appropriate source locations. So um, I am certainly not an expert in this regard, but I'll, I've deferred to others. And um, the guidelines that we've come up with have been to use the EPA eco-region map boundaries sort of as our, our our guideline for what appropriate seed sourcing is as much as possible. So um, Philadelphia is fortunate to be split in two between the Piedmont and the Atlantic Coastal Plain. So we get two eco regions to source from. Um, so we can cover a fairly broad geographic area and stay within our level three eco regions down into the Delmarva Peninsula along the state line and into Maryland. Um, and then wherever else we have to go to get the seed that we need. But we always, um, we try to source it as close as possible, but we'll go as far as we have to, to get the species that we need. So we have a target list of about 170 native woody plants um, with varying levels of priority. Um, I'll say that on an average year, we're producing around 75 species of trees and shrubs. We're primarily focused on woody species. We do occasionally do some herbaceous material for special projects like meadow creation or wetland work, that sort of thing. But trees and shrubs are really our, our bread and butter. And um, we're mostly working with, you know, that more limited palette, trying to keep common species common, though we do occasionally work with some rare and endangered species on a limited basis. So the first step in the process is identifying source locations. So you know, we do this by scouring um, herbarium records, uh, botanical club, field trip notes, uh, word of mouth, and just basically a lot of time in the field. Once a uh, species or source location is identified, um, we tend to work on a lot of uh, public land, so state, federal, and local um, properties, sometimes private property. Um, each of them have their own permitting process or permission system, so we go through the proper channels to get permission to to remove seeds. Um, we're never removing plants from the landscape. We're only collecting seed and you know, have protocols in place so that our collection efforts aren't negatively impacting any of the, the source populations. We have a pretty rudimentary um, kit to do our seed collection in the field. Uh, you know, a couple orchard ladders, some tree climbing gear, a good pair of rubber boots, um, pole pruners. And then we also did pick up these um, seed collection rollers um, a couple years ago, which have proven surprisingly useful. 
And then, you know, starting in, I mean, it's going on all year, but really the bulk of seed collection happens in the late summer into the early fall. We head into some fairly remote and rugged areas, um, some fairly manicured areas. And I'm always kind of looking for the intersection of those two where we can find these larger contiguous blocks of, of undisturbed natural areas that have some sort of ease of access. So um, power line right of ways, uh, access roads, that sort of thing, because time is always limited. Um, we're a very small staff. So I'm the only uh, full-time staff member focused on nursery work. I've had assistance from seasonal employees over the year on a limited basis, but we're, we're a pretty small team. So um, we're always stretched for time. So maximizing our impact when we're in the field is, is always a goal. So finding these high quality sites with a large number of individuals so that our collections represent a good genetic diversity from the source population. So this situation right here is, is really what I'm ideally looking for, being able to drive down an access road with someone in the back of a pickup just pulling seeds off the trees is, is like a dream come true. Um, all collection locations get logged in a GIS system. So we use a, a phone or an iPad out in the field and take coordinates and some details about the, the source location so that we can find these things again and just for our internal records. So collections in the field, you know, are pretty rough. So um, they include, you know, whole fruits, accessory structures, empty seeds, damaged seeds. As you'll see on the left, we use you know basically Ziploc bags and paper envelopes to collect, um, and then the goal is ultimately to end up with something like you see on the right, um, well cleaned, um, nothing but pure live seed, fully viable, counted, cleaned, and ready for storage or propagation. So cleaning, we use some pretty simplistic methods. Um, if anyone watched the excellent seed cleaning micro meeting from a couple of weeks ago. Um, we use a lot of those same practices, uh, a lot of sieves and, and soil screens for dry seeds, you know, a kitchen sieve and a, some running water for, for fleshy fruits. Um, I will say that one tool that I found exceedingly useful is a food processor for small seed lots. We replace the blades with um, small sections of string trimmer line and it is like somehow just the right amount of aggressive to, to break up those accessory structures, but without damaging any of the actual seeds. So that's definitely my one pro tip for anyone else who's trying to process small seed lots. Um, the other useful tool here is a, a sort of home-built aspirator. This is just basically a shop vac and some PVC pipe. Um, it's got a router speed control on it so we can adjust the strength of the volume and that helps just basically separate the seed from the chaff in a, a controlled manner. So once we have things relatively clean, we do just a simple cut test to ensure we're ending up with viable seed. And then we're also checking the moisture content of the seed and we use a pretty simple non-destructive method. Um, we use a like inexpensive hygrometer and a small sealed container. So seed will equilibrate with their environment. Um, so if they're in a humid environment, they'll take in moisture. If they're in a dry environment, they'll lose it. But if you seal them in a small container, um, the moisture content of the seed will sort of dominate the remaining airspace. And so by measuring that the humidity of that remaining airspace, um, you can get a rough idea of what the internal moisture content of the seed is pretty quickly and without having to um, oven dry your seed and therefore kill it. So um, if seeds are tolerant of desiccation, um, we tend to dry and store them. There's a number of species we grow that we collect that are intolerant of desiccation or recalcitrant. And so we'll monitor them just to make sure they're at a high enough moisture content that they're not gonna lose viability. So after that, um, all seed lots get assigned a unique accession number which stays with the seed lot through storage and then follows any plants that we propagate from those seed lots through production and then also get tagged to our outplanting location. So we can always trace back uh, what plants end up in the field and where they originally came from. Um, we will hand count smaller seed lots and larger lots we will weigh and then often count like a replicate of hundred seeds or a thousand seeds. So we can get some information on, on uh, seeds per gram just to facilitate uh, quicker pulls as we're taking stuff out of storage for future crops um, and just to help us learn a little bit more about each of these seed lots. 
so then, you know, every year we're developing propagation plans. Um, it's fairly rare that we know far enough in advance what our uh, project requirements are going to be. So often my crop plans are speculative and then I'm producing basically a wide variety of species and quantities that I know will have a general use for. Um, and then, you know, most of these native species have some sort of dormancy requirement that has to be overcome. Um, nothing really is that complicated. It's kind of whether it needs scarification, does it need a warm period, how long, does it need a cold period, and how long, and does the seed require light to germinate. So it's usually some combination of those four factors that we're looking to overcome. And again, it's pretty simplistic methods, you know, boiling water or hand scarification with uh, sandpaper on a clipboard here. Um, most species just require a, a cold period um, mimicking winter treatment. So often that's just done in a commercial refrigerator. Um, much of our stratification is done either without media or in sand. Um, I find that it helps facilitate uh, accurate seed sowing. You can quickly separate seed lots from the sand if needed or if they're very small seeds, um, you can simply sow that sand with the seed directly into the germination container all at once and then um, go from there. As I said, we um, often will move seed lots into a cooler in the greenhouse, uh, you know, a nice protected warm environment to start the germination process to make sure that we're putting uh, pure viable seeds into each container. Um, Most seed is sown by hand, um, but uh, we do occasionally use a small vacuum seeder to sow reliable seed lots. So when things get to this point, you can obviously breathe a little sigh of relief, um, know that you did everything right in the first stage, and then you've just got the rest of the process to deal with. So you're shooting for rapid and even germination, ideally ending up with something like this uh, in the first stage. So historically, our propagation phase has been focused on production of 50 and 38 cell plugs, as well as um, smaller three by six inch band pot style production trays. Uh, but we've been moving more towards uh, sewing into larger communal flats like these bulb crates. Um, I found that a little bit lower plant density, treating them basically like uh, miniature bare root production beds um, has produced some pretty high quality crops and this was something I had tried a little bit in previous years, but um, with the shutdowns of spring 2020, you know, it was March and I had uh, lots of seed in process that I had, um, you know, gone through a lot of work to get from the field and wasn't quite sure what was going to happen this spring. And so I wanted to uh, make sure that most of these seedlings had a chance to thrive. And um, so I decided to do it a little bit more intensively in the bulb crates, uh, just because that larger soil volume requires a little bit less precision and irrigation and thinking that things wouldn't need any transplanting midway through the season. So um, we did most of our tree species in these bulb crates this past spring. And uh, we ended up with uh, one of the nicest crops of seedlings that I've grown over the past uh, years. And so basically these crates then just got thin to um, usually between 10 and 20 plants per square foot, moved through the greenhouse into outside and um, once dormant were then bare rooted, graded for caliper and height. And uh, we found that the, the open sides and bottom of the, the bulb crates um, really produced a nicely air pruned, fibrous, well branched root system. Um, and then, so these bare root plants will then just slide back into our standard container production sequence. Um, we did purchase through a, a generous grant from Audubon of Pennsylvania, this soil mixer and pot filler uh, back in late 2019. So this will take a, a little over a yard of um, container mix. It then has that uh, yellow petal operated just to, to automate the filling process, uh, which takes a lot of the hand labor out of the work we were previously you know, mostly scooping out of a, the bucket of a tractor. So this has definitely removed a lot of the hard lab labor out of the process, which is nice. From there, um, plants go out into the outdoor open container yard just with overhead irrigation. We try to group things by uh, cultural requirements. So light and water as much as possible. You can see, um, you know, our crop sizes tend to be fairly small. 
So, um, you know, anywhere from five to 300 or something like that is pretty standard for us and a large number of different species. So um, it's hard to really automate things too much just because there's such a variety of species with differing requirements. So we end up doing a lot of hand watering and a lot of um, independent care of these things. Um, we do uh, a minimal amount of pest control. I mean, because these are conservation grade plants, we have a pretty high threshold for damage. Um, our IPM program is largely based on uh, biological controls. Um, so we do some green lacewing releases and a lot of monitoring and um, occasionally some spraying as needed. Plants tend to take between two and five years to get to a finished size. So overwintering of container plants is done just in an unheated cold frame with single layer of poly or they're watered, laid down inside a raised bed. We'll put a couple layers of microfoam and white poly plastic over the top and seal them up and uh, have pretty good results with that. And then after a couple of years, depending on the species, we end up with our finished product. Um, generally that's between a two and a seven gallon plant that's between three and six feet tall. Um, you know, I'm always trying to get things out the door as fast as possible. So things that go inside of a deer exclosure can afford to be a little bit smaller, um, but we still need them big enough that they're gonna establish and not get swallowed by invasives too quickly. And if they're outside of a deer exclosure, they've gotta be big enough that the leader is either above the browse line or the plant is big enough for some sort of individual tree protection. And so then, you know, every year we try to just repeat the cycle, take copious notes during the process so that we can try and repeat our successes and not repeat our failures. Um, and that's kind of the process um, start to finish. I wanna just call out a couple quick um, unusual projects that we're working on apart from our usual production. Um, the first is a partnership with the US Forest Service. There's a couple of researchers who are looking at the use of hybrid poplars, which had been bred for um, biomass production and phytoremediation about their applicability to degraded urban sites. So basically acting as a green cover crop, um, being able to install dormant cuttings or rooted plants into canopy gaps and establish rapid canopy closure to prevent some of the establishment of invasives and then follow that up with um, underplanting of later successional species of higher value. So we managed to get this stool bed installed at the nursery this past spring. Um, went in a little later than expected because schedules were obviously complicated this past spring, but we got several hundred um, cuttings of these hybrid poplars as, as well as some locally collected salix and populus. And so these went in as you know six inch dormant stem cuttings in May. And by the fall, many of the plants were over six feet tall. So um, this is pretty cool as you can understand <laughs> having heard the, some of the convoluted processes that we have to go to to grow our standard crops from seed. The fact that we put a stick in the ground in May and in October, it was a six foot tall plant is pretty amazing and a little frustrating, I'll admit. But um, so I have great faith in the promise of these plants. And then the other is that I'm also always looking to improve the sustainability of our operation. So trying to minimize the impact of plant production itself. And one thing I'm interested in working on is developing an in-house container substrate. So the container media is one of our biggest yearly expenses. Um, often those materials are of less than sustainable origins. So we're next door to a large municipal composting facility, which takes in all kinds of organic debris from the city, you know, leaves collected from the streets and down trees from parks and streets. And uh, also a incredible number of Christmas trees that get discarded after the holiday season. So I've been doing a little work in researching whether these discarded Christmas trees can be processed into the, the bulk product for a container substrate. So basically running those trees through a hammer mill, grinding them down needle small um, to a smaller size, mixing with some of the municipal compost that they provided. And um, we did run some small trials with one upland and one wetland species, uh, Junipers virginiana and Ilex verticillata, and tracked the physical and chemical properties of the media over time, as well as the the growth of the plants and then uh, harvested them at the, the end of the season and looked at their biomass production and measured some of the morphological characteristics to assess um, how the media compared to one of our standard sort of commercially sourced mixes. Um, 
Our Christmas tree mix was a little behind in biomass production, but other than that, um, other morphological characteristics and the chemical properties were exceedingly reasonable for um, what was basically ground up Christmas trees. So with a little tweaking, I'm pretty sure we can come up with something that works just as well as our commercial mixes and just trying to figure out a way to scale up production of uh, that material for um, all of the use that we need. And so that's all I've got for you today. Thanks to everyone for um, putting up with this. I'm, I'm hopeful that there was something that was useful for someone out there and also that um, all of the professional propagators in the audience here can uh, maybe make some suggestions, some things I'm doing wrong or uh, opportunities to make improvements. So thank you for taking the time. Awesome, Max. Thank you so much. Uh, I wrote down a ton of questions. So we're going to figure out how to make that, how to get you questions at the end. So um, thanks, everybody, uh, for hopping back on and just all your patience. Um, and we're going to head to southwest Philadelphia. Um, nestled on the Schuylkill River is Bartram's Garden, which is rich in history. And it's my pleasure to welcome Dan Feeser, the greenhouse and nursery manager who first engaged in the plant world during his time at Temple University, where he initiated their first community garden in North Philadelphia. Daniel began his horticulture career at Longwood Gardens. Um, I know Dan from that program, the PG program, and since 2012 has been working in the urban horticulture industry at such places as Philadelphia Parks and Rec, Cornell Cooperative Extension, Central Park Conservancy, and Bartram's Garden. His roles have ranged from horticulture training and community programming to greenhouse management. So Dan, welcome and take it away. Hi all and thanks Shelby for the welcoming. Um, thanks for everybody who's still tagging along um, today. Um, I'm going to, I guess, rule right into the presentation and let me share the screen for you. As Shelby noted, um, I am the Greenhouse and Nursery Manager at Bartram's Garden. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with Bartram's Garden, it is a park. It is a botanical garden. It has a community farm. It has a river program. And it has um, many other things going on in that landscape. Um, so today, I'm going to really be focusing on, well, just giving you a sneak peek into the past and present happenings of this site, because there's it's loaded with history. Um, I am not a historian, so um, I will try to break things down as much as possible, but we're just going to be skimming the surface. Um, and as far as any questions, I guess we'll save those for the end. Okay, so the basic rundown of the presentation today is we're going to go over a brief history. Uh, we're going to focus on the historic greenhouses and the present day greenhouses, talk a little bit about plant sales and shipment and what we're thinking about when it comes to the future of the greenhouse and nursery. So as I said, this is a land with many stories, as with all of our land within North America. Uh, and I thought it's really important that we break some of that down uh, because it should, it's important that we think about where this land came from, where it has been and where it can go. Um, so Bartram's Garden, it's currently a 45 acre site. Um, and on these grounds, it is Lenny Lenape land. So there have been, there's archeological evidence that dates back to uh, 3000 BCE, 3000 BCE um, that has been found on the site. Uh, as far as what this site was used for is probably because we're right along the river, very important note, um, it was probably used for fishing, farming um, during that time period. So 
So then if we roll down history more, um, colonialization happened. Uh, so Native Americans, the population started to dwindle because of diseases, because of internal external fights. And then eventually this land uh, turned into a Swedish plantation. So basically the Swedes took this land and turned it into a space where we're not exactly sure what was grown on this land in particular, but talking to Joel, our historian, um, typically a Swedish plantation would grow things like tobacco. So that's where this land was within the mid 19th century. Then at one point, the land was eventually parceled out uh, because people took ownership of this land. I um, mean, there were certain debts that needed to be paid and this land went up for a sheriff sale. And John Bartram, who we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, purchased this property in 1728. And there are three generations of Bartrams that lived on this land, uh, which in total at one point, it was about 110 acres of property. Um, that spans the whole way through 1850. So in 1850, actually the last generation of the Bartrams, uh, they went bankrupt. And the property was then purchased through Andrew Eastwick, 1850s through 1879. Um, a lot of the greenhouses at that point were gone or just no longer there, besides the small one that we'll talk about later. Um, and Andrew Eastwick died. So then the land went into like disrepair. It was eventually uh, took an, taken over by the Fairmount Park. So now we call it Philadelphia Parks and Recreation. Um, and that was in 1891. And shortly after the John Bartram Association partnered with that, then the John Bartram Association actually became the land managers in 1980. So we have many layers of history that exist within the land. So this land has experienced much hardship. It has experienced much curiosity, sadness, hope, many things that exist within this space. And um, I think that's really important to recognize as we break down and talk about the Bartram history and beyond for this space. Okay, so as I noted, we're gonna talk talk is, talk uh, about the Bartram specifically. So first we'll talk about John Bartram, some of his sons, uh, William and John, and then we'll talk about Ann Bartram Carr. So John Bartram, the first of them. Uh, so he grew up in Derby, which is a Philadelphia suburb. He was raised by his grandmother. Um, he was a farmer, gardener, builder, Quaker, philosopher. And as we are all, most of us are plant people, he was a self-taught botanist. So most of the information that he attained through his life, he did not have a formal education. So he learned it through the people that he met, through reading all the books that he could, all the books that he could. So he tried to absorb this information as much as possible. Um, so he was very fascinated with the natural world. Um, I also think it's important to recognize the fact that John Bartram, he went through much loss in his life. His mother died when he was two years old. His father passed, well, his father died in a raid in the South with the Native Americans. His first wife passed away. One of his sons passed away and then one of his daughters passed away. So I think this, when we're talking about John Barstrom as a person really has shaped, would really have shaped him um, because experience so much hardship definitely shapes an individual. Then what, besides John Bartram's fascination with the natural world, what got him into this connection? And his first connection was Peter Collinson. Um, so he developed a relationship with Peter Collinson, who was a London cloth merchant. And they eventually started a transcontinental business where John Bartram would collect plants. He would also collect insects and some animals such as turtle, turtle eggs. And he would ship those overseas with the help of Peter Collinson who had connections over in Europe uh, and Britain. And I think when we're talking about the importance of the documentation and John Bartram in the horticulture history, he helped, well, he, he shaped the European horticulture um, 
during that time period. So he collected plants all in a fairly large span um, from Lake Ontario, New England, south of Florida, and then all the way west to the Allegheny Mountains and then to the Ohio River. Uh, so he was on a lot of expeditions to do this and it's something he was really excited about. Um, and besides doing that, he, was, he also ran a farm, um, which I'm sure he probably had help with that, which I think I'm gonna point out later. So that is the first Bartram. We're gonna to roll to the next one. Okay, well, William is technically not the next Bartram. Uh, John Bartram had about nine children, I believe. And William, I think, was one of the middle children. He's probably one of the most well-known of the Bartrams. Uh, he did have a formal education. And William and John Bartram Jr., Jr. Um, they, were the, they were two that continued the nursery business that their father created. Um, William also wrote travels which documents one of the trips in 1773 through North and South Carolina uh, and had developed relationships with the Creek and Cherokee nations. And I think this is really important to recognize because some of this knowledge did come from the Native Americans. Um, they are the ones that were on this land before, before the Bartrams. So they had this accrued knowledge that was really useful in the documentation of all this. I think I also want to point out when it comes to the importance of William is that he was one of the first ornithologists and he became an illustrator of birds and was very fascinated with things beyond plants, um, just like his father. Uh, and there are over 250 known botanical illustrations. And speaking of one of the illustrations, I guess we can't really have a Bartram presentation if we don't talk about the well, at least one plant. So here we have Franklinia altamaha. Uh, if you can see my hand pointing to that one, that is the that is this flower that's a part of this tree right here. So Franklinia altamaha is probably one of the most well known when it comes to the importance of the plant documentation for the Bartram history. Uh, this plant was documented on the Altamaha River in Georgia by both John and William. I mean, both William, well, when I say William is the first, well, the first John, so the father and the son William. So they documented this and that plant is actually not known to be in existence any longer living naturally, growing wild within the landscape. The only plants that we have now are cultivated in nursery and are most likely or are related to the one that was cultivated and collected from the bar trips. I also think because we're talking about all these layers in history, um, this family, they were Quakers. Quakers are known to be against slavery um, and they were abolitionists, but they were also part of the society. This was that had a foundation of slavery. So I want to point out that in 1776, before, um, before William went on these travels with his father, uh, he attempted a failed rice plantation. And there's documentation that shows that he purchased slaves um, through his father's money. Uh, Jack, Sibby, Jake, Sam, Bacchus, and Flora were noted in documentation that when William attempted to create this rice plantation, um, they were purchased. As far as what happened after, after these individuals were purchased, the, the record is unsure. We just know that William came back from that attempt penniless. Um, and I think this is really important to note because we are a colonial garden that really needs to break down some of that history. Um, and when we're thinking about all the elements of history, there's so many layers to it. Okay, rolling back into plants, uh, in 1783, um, we have a broadside catalog, which if you, I guess it's a little challenging to see, but you can see how um, many of the plants were ordered on here. This is a catalog that 
uh, was shared with clients so they could see the inventory of what was being sold. Then we roll into the next period, uh, the Ann Bartram Carr period, who married Robert Carr. So Ann Bartram, she was the daughter of John Jr., which we didn't talk much about, uh, but John Jr. was working alongside William. Um, uh, there's less notations from John Jr., maybe because he was um, working more on the land and managing the nursery from the physical aspect. But going to Ann Bartram, she marries Robert Carr and they work together to continue the nursery trade. And they expanded the number of greenhouses. Uh, so at that point, I think they were about at about 10 greenhouses. Um, they got up to 1400 native plants and up to 1000 exotic plants at peak. So when we think of Bartram's, yes, all these plants were collected. Um, Many of these plants that we think about Bartrams were collected in North America along that line that we talked about earlier. Um, but plants were also coming from overseas and there was a trade between both. So from North America to Europe, from Europe to North America. An important contribution when we're thinking about Anne is she made the garden open to the public. And she also grew fashionable plants, exotic plants from Asia, and is known for, um, I guess, hybridizing dahlias and camellias. I have this picture over on the right-hand side, the bottom right, and that is actually an illustration from Anne Bartram Carr. Uh, she was, I think she's a really important figure because she was, she had a, a, a great relationship with William. And William was the one who really knew the operation and knew horticulture. And um, because of that relation, most of the knowledge when Anne Bartram and Robert Carr worked together was probably from Anne. Uh, so I think we should really give Anne credit for that. Then uh, we hit bankruptcy and the property was sold to Andrew Eastwick, who was a railroad industrious, industrialist. And the property was then managed. Um, he had a gardener named Thomas Meehan. At that point, there were really no um, greenhouses on site. And then just for those that might be interested, here is an advertisement that would have been, I guess, shared during the time periods of the, of the cars. So this would have been a multi-page. Um, um, catalog because as we noted there are like thousand like over a thousand plants on there um, so it's multi-pages and if there's any interest in this information um, Joel has been Joel who is a, our historian has been an incredible resource in sharing this so just a rule before we roll on to the next piece I just want to make sure we acknowledge all of the contributions that have made um, the documentation and knowledge we've accrued over time about these native plants and where they were originally um, coming from the Native Americans. I think during William's expedition, he developed a relationship with the Native Americans where he, he did not speak um, their tongue, but he did, uh, he did, um, have a translator. So I think another important thing to note is they would, um, William would mainly be working with the chiefs. So actually the knowledge of the plants would have been within the females. So thinking about, and also the decision, decision making would have been within the females. So think about how that translation would have worked, I guess is an, also an important factor. Um, then I think another acknowledgement that we should, bring up is the wives, like thinking about John Bartram's wife, Anne Mendenhall, she, John was going on expeditions for potentially like weeks to months at a time. So someone needed to like manage the upkeep of, or like manage the family, um, all the children that they had, help manage any of the tasks within the farm, the cooking, the cleaning, all these things within their hundred acre farm 
and also all the guests that would come. I think there's less documentation when it comes to the servants and hired hands, but I'm, it's most likely that they, they had some type of servants and some hired hands on site. And then I'm sure other children were helping within the nursery business, just less, less documentation on that. And then of course, the contributions of those that we just don't know about. Okay, that was just like skimming the surface of three generations of Bartrams on site. And now I just wanted to roll into some of the greenhouses themselves. And I'm breaking that down into three different phases. So first we have 1760. That's when John Bartram created the first small greenhouse. That one's the one still standing. I'll show you pictures of that. Then 1780 to 1800, to Marine William and John Bartram. Junior, uh, there is one large greenhouse, 65 by 30. Um, there actually is a picture of a part of that one. So that will, I will show you that also. And then from 1819 to 1837, during the car period, there are additional eight greenhouses. And then at present, we just have one heated greenhouse with cold frame and some nursery space in the lay down area. So it's a lot smaller than um, Max's facility. I also wanted to note on the left-hand side here, we have a picture of the old Landreth nurturers. Thinking about the third generation of Bartrams, the car period, um, there were other nurseries that were in business. So the David and Cuthbert Landreth, they came to Philadelphia after the revolution and they sold some similar plants that the cars would. Um, but their main business was kitchen garden and farm, farm seeds, so more agriculturally focused. Okay, so the first greenhouse, um, on the left-hand side, we have a schematic, I guess, of, this, of, that, of that greenhouse that's still standing. Um, this greenhouse was, the walls were made of, are made of Wissahick and Schist, all hand create, or all hand laid by John Bartram. And you can notice well, I guess you'll see in the picture, there aren't many windows. Um, there is one side that is based, would have been basically been all windows, which if you can see this cursor scrolling right here, I'm in the middle of that elevated piece. That's where the windows would have been. And then this was heated by the Franklin stove, uh, and most likely wood with two flues. And we know that this was created by Bartram, or the first of the Bartrams, uh, because we have a note that went to Peter Collinson, who was the first of the ones that connect or trigger this transcontinental trade um, into London. Okay, so here's the picture of the present day uh, greenhouse that's still standing from 1760. If you go, if you look at the bottom left picture, um, you see this like wooden panel that's been painted like a beige, that would have been glass. Uh, so that's where the sunlight would have been coming in. Also on the side in the middle bottom picture, there's also another window. And then at the base of the structure, we have the vents and that's where um, any smoke would just be ventilated out when they wanted to keep the structure heated. Then we roll on to another greenhouse that we have a picture, kind of, well, we have a, a piece of the picture um, that Joel or Storian shared, and this dates back to 1875. Um, this was also made uh, by stone, but it's whitewashed. Uh, so I have it circled right here. We have one door, we have one window, on the wall and on the roof, we also have this window right here. Since we can't really see the side of the greenhouse, um, we're guessing that there probably was one line of glass um, to add more light. Um, glass was probably a more precious commodity than it is now, expensive moving it from point A to point B. And then the last period, 18 to 19 to 1837 for the Greenhouses, we had all these greenhouses that were documented in 1837 by Alexander Gordon, uh, who visited 
the property when the cars were not at home. And just to sum up the greenhouses, um, they were made of stone masonry and brick, minimal use of glass, uh, and most likely the glass was second or third grade glass, so it wasn't as clear as the glass we would have today, uh, a little less transparent. And then the glass would be framed with wood, which is probably another re reason why some of these are no longer standing because of rot. And the picture that we have right here is actually a Bartram relative. I'm not remembering which one. And fast forward. Okay, so now we have our modern greenhouse that was just finished uh, a little less than three years, three years ago. So this is basically a double poly greenhouse um, where we grow our tender perennials, vegetables, and perennials. We just have overhead electric heaters and it's definitely nothing like too complicated. We just have an iGrow system that regulates the vents and the heaters. This is where we use it as also as a uh, structure to take in our tender perennials. So there may be some questions as to what do we grow in the present day greenhouse? Very good question. Um, something that's always, I guess, a continuous process because we have so much history to break down and understand. Uh, but one of the things that we look at is the living collection policy. And that is kind of formulated from all the documentation from the catalogs that exists in the archive. Um, so we can see what was grown. And we also think about what plants would have been growing along the corridor that was explored during the Bartram's time. And as far as vegetables, um, the vegetables grown um, in the kitchen garden, Mandy, who's one of the gardeners, she specifically grows 18th and 19th century vegetables, um, which vegetables, uh, as she notes, are also classified like broken, also the herbs. So herbs and vegetables all in one group, all called vegetables. Um, so she's done some really great research as far as like what plants and heirloom varieties go back to that time period. And of course, we're growing many native plants. Um, so the plants, of course, are selected based off of the living collection policy, but other documentation and records that we can find. And because we are also in this urban environment, we are in Southwest Philadelphia, um, which I didn't really know. Uh, Bartram's Garden being in Southwest Philadelphia, we, on one side of the river, we have oil refineries. On the other side, we have both residential and more industry. So, Bartram's Garden is a really important green space and all the histories that exist with it to keep it that green space is really important to break down. So the plants that we also select, we think about some of the urban restraints and some plants that can tolerate a little bit more pollution, um, compaction. I think that's really important to add to our list. And besides our greenhouse, we have a cold frame. Um, so this is one of our, well, we have just have one cold frame at present. Um, there's no archeological evidence of cold frames in the past, but most likely there was much framing in use during the Bartram's time period. Uh, so this is where we put all of our uh, perennials during the winter time. And rolling along, we didn't mention how plants got from point A to point B. So when plants were shipped during trans transcontinental trade, what would be included in a wooden box? So the Bartram's box would be a catalog uh, and a handwritten note of the contents. On the right-hand side, you have a um, handwritten documentation of what was sent to Mount Vernon in 1792 for George Washington. Then as far as what plants were available, I think when we're thinking about that really vary based on seed crop, creek seed crops, um, only 20% of plants appear on yearly lists. So thinking of that, um, maybe there were success or failures that happened within the nursery itself. Um, so we had 20% consistency. 
then at that time, things had to go by boat. Um, so they had to escape seawater, rats, and theft. And many of them made it. Um, the things that were shipped were not just plants. Uh, I think in one documentation that I was reading, um, Peter Collinson actually got turtles that just hatched um, from, from the Bartrams, which was which is quite interesting to think about the expeditions that those turtles had to experience. Uh, and these plants remained an international commodity until 1840. And then bringing us to present day, now we're online. Uh, we actually were not online before COVID, um, but now because connecting with people and giving them opportunities to grow more plants in their yard, uh, I think an online platform has really benefited us. Uh, and then we do on-site nursery pickup. We also sell seeds. Uh, Mandy, Katie, Marissa, and Ryan, uh, and then other interns, they um, collect seeds throughout the site. And those are, I guess, processed. And then some of them go into the online shop. So if anybody's interested in those, in those seeds that are collected on the site, give a shout. And here's the barnyard at Bartram's Garden on the left-hand side. And before COVID, we had a sales floor where we included all the plants that were coming up from the nursery um, for sale. So it's a fundraiser that really goes towards the continued propagation, but also the free programming that the site does. And then on the right-hand side, our format obviously had to change because of COVID. So we structured it in a way that we minimized contact. Uh, so we created time slots. Um, if there's any question about um, if anybody's trying to do a plant sale um, during the time of COVID, feel free to ask any questions. Um, also down to hear your thoughts on ways to get those plants dispersed to people dispersed to people in the most safe and effective way. Okay, so we really just skimmed the surface, but I'm hoping that gave everybody I guess a foundation in the importance of Bartrams and the many layers that exist within the land itself. Um, and I just wanna have everybody stay tuned for future versions of the plant catalog as we break that down and figure out what we should be growing, why we should be growing it. Um, Cause that's definitely a conversation to be had as we think about plants that connect to the, the nursery and its history, but we also think about the plants that connect to the cultures around us in present day. So definitely come check us out uh, where garden, farm, nursery, orchard, and meadow meet river. We are a place of many histories and many things and we welcome you to come there. Um, and I just want a big shout out to all my colleagues who have been such a great inspiration both at Bartrams and beyond. Uh, and here's some resources to check out. Um, the stories we know, when we're talking about the black history of Southwest Philadelphia, Sharice, uh, she actually is one of the historians who documented a lot of the black history um, related to the Bartrams and also in um, Southwest Philly. Really great information. There's free, um, there's a free PDF version online if you Google that. And then here are some other books that I recommend, but I'm sure you folks have many other books um, that I guess could also be recommendations. So feel free to share those. And I also included my email for those who may be interested, feel free to reach out. I'm always interested in a collab and learning what your thoughts and are in relationship to plant propagation. And I think that ends it. Awesome, thanks so much, Dan. That was super informative. Um, I visited Bartram's, but not when they were open. And I really need to get back to um, explore more of the historical piece. I love that aspect of the garden tremendously. So um, again, thank you to both Dan and Max for presenting. And thanks everybody for joining us. I just wanna again, apologize for our earlier interruption and really appreciate you guys uh, coming, coming back on and hearing the rest of our presentation. So. We are able to dive into a time of questions. If you wanna type anything into the chat, um, the panelists can see that and I'll be able to see your questions as well as the Q&A feature, um, which is at the bottom of the screen. 
and I've gotten a few already. Or if anybody out there who knows me can text my phone. So again, thanks everyone for coming. And let's see. Dan, I have a few questions for you since that is fresh in everyone's mind. Um, no. There's a question about your living uh, collection policy. If you, oh my gosh. <laughs> you, could simply, you could simply, we also have that at Mount Cuba Center. So we can just, you know, express that that is um, kind of our, our governing um, document that we run all of our plant material through like what we let on property that we're like, okay, this fits into Mount Cuba Center's mission, so. Well, I wouldn't be the best one to, I guess, I guess I can just say what I know from the living collection policy. I think it actually dates over a decade. So I think there's conversation about updating it. Um, so Jewel Fry, our historian, would be the best contact to talk about that. But um, there are two full-time horticulturists outside Katie and Mandy. Um, and I and um, other folks, um, other gardeners on site are talking about what is the future of that. There needs to be more conversation had. Um, yeah. Okay, awesome. We'll get the spotlight off of you and back on, on Max. So um, this question has been hanging around for a little while, Max. Um, someone's asking how long you compost the Christmas tree container medium um, before using. Yeah, so we initially used it pretty fresh. So, you know, those trees uh, end up discarded uh, in like mid-January and we process them pretty quickly after that. And then they basically sat um, until we started potting in, you know, like mid-March. So it was about like 60 to 75 days. Um, so the material is still pretty green and uh, it definitely was higher in airspace and lower in water holding capacity. So that was one of the challenges, but mm -hmm. in keeping the material around, even without mixing with anything else, I found that a little extra time does improve those physical properties. It, it breaks down pretty nicely. So I think the more time you can give it, if we could stage stuff for a whole season, I think that would be great. But uh, yeah. whether or not we have the space for that is another question. Do you have plans to try that on different species that might be a little bit fussier, you know, than the Ilex particulata? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We're one of the challenges is the the um, processing equipment. So you know, we had a pretty small trial at first, and I'm working on trying to get some grant funding for a larger piece of equipment to process a little more efficiently. So once we have a little bit more material, we can start messing around with it a little bit more. Nice. I'm actually curious, um, the medium that you're using right now, do you do you purchase a commercial mix that you're able to use as is, or are you doing any kind of amending to that? Um, we're generally purchasing, yeah, a pre-made commercial blend from um, either a local supplier or from a greenhouse supplier. So um, pretty simplistic at this point. Right on. Um, it looks like there might be a follow up to the Christmas tree uh, medium question asking about proportions. Probably, be, you know, between the, I think you mentioned using a compost that's also from that facility or a leaf compost. Yeah, so uh, the initial trial was basically 75% Christmas trees and then 25% um, the compost that's produced, which is um, primarily leaves. Uh, mixed with herbivore manure, so 75-25, and um, I would probably cut back a little bit on the compost if we could age the Christmas trees a little bit more. And I, there's a lot of really great research about these sort of uh, sustainable substrates out there that folks from uh, a number of universities and extensions are working on, so there's lots of other um, much more refined research out there at this point. I'm just kind of trying to take that work and make it work at our operation. I'm happy to direct people to those resources. I feel you can uh, definitely experiment almost limitlessly uh, with medium and yeah, there, I, I could speak from that from Mount Cuba as well. Okay, Dan, um, there was a question about your first slide um, from Susanna and it was about the George Washington quote that I believe was up there that says, mm -hmm. Oh, let me find it here, sorry. Was, was just curious how much of an insult it was or whether it was a compliment, you know, the language of the day. Um, you know, 
not laid off with much taste. Well, I think that goes back to, I guess, what individuals would have been considered laid off. Um, and I guess historically, um, like things would have been more formalized. This is, I think, oh, oh, I don't like using the word wild, but it's more like a naturalized garden. Um, so things would have been laid out, like when you were going to Europe, you have uh, very linear sets and clumps of plants. This, this is more like a, I guess like a test subject garden where you have lots and lots of plants like clustered in um, spots. There isn't that much information um, when talking to Mandy, our gardener, one of our gardeners there, uh, like how it exactly would have been laid out. Um, but if someone who's used to seeing a very formal garden um, and then seeing something that looks so naturalized and something beautiful that you would see in the wild, um, obviously our perceptions of like what beautiful is have shifted and changed over time. And it's just a human definition, um, I think. It probably was meant as like a, a little insult, <laughs> I would say, but eh. It, it seemed like a tasteful insult, the way that it's that it was uh, put out there. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's very, but it, you bring up a good point about how, just how much gardening has changed, you know, since the 40s and 50s and what people put in their, you know, their front garden bed. And um, I remember hearing a, a lecture, you know, years ago, and she actually, she's in Philadelphia, and she happened to be a lawyer as well, and then really got into gardening, and her whole front garden was native plants that she would leave go over the winter for habitat, you know, for birds and wildlife, and, you know, was, you know, sent a ticket by her community for an unsightly, you know, mess type thing, um, and so it's really, you know, she ended up fighting this in court and, you know, and won, but it just shows how just that educational component and how our perceptions have changed of what a garden is. And so, yeah, that's kind of speaks to today as well. So you can, you can imagine back in, in the day. So. Truth. Yeah. Very cool. And now you can get a backyard habitat certification. And so, yeah, it's tremendous. I actually wanted to ask you a bit about the car restoration project. Um, do you know about that that time period? So I I have the privilege of knowing um, Dan's predecessor in the nursery um, because when you came to Barchman's, it the the nursery and greenhouses had been vacated for a spell, I believe, and so you really got that operation running again. Um, and I remember there was a certain part of the garden that. Um, you were going to restore back to a specific time period, um, back to when the cars had been there. Uh, so, so well, I guess when Katie um, is one of our gardeners, and she, one of her landscapes that she manages is the car garden. Um, so the restoration, oof, I should know how many years it's been, but it's been several years since it's been restored. Um, there are definitely challenges that. Um, in conversations with Katie about like, plant choice and all those things, especially the boxwoods. So that's, I think that's been a challenge for that site, but Katie has definitely like brought that to fruition and really added crazy assortment of plants that would have been growing during that time period. Um, so it's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, the nursery before I came did, ex well, there were no greenhouses before, well, they weren't finished greenhouses before I came. Um, of course, there were like back dating back to the Bartrams, but sure. they're no there, no longer there. Um, that answer your question. Yeah, oh. no, totally. I have a tendency to when I don't know the time period, I'm like, oh, it was several years ago we did that, and it probably was ten years ago. Um, but I'm always curious to come and visit that part of the garden because we were able to. Um, Mount Cuba Center tracking our provenance and data as well. We're able to grow, you know, several plants for that project that were of Delaware provenance. So that, that project I thought was really cool. Let me check this out. Ah, here's a question that actually I was about to dive into as well. Um, from Gustavo for Max. Um, 
Could you elaborate on the live um, stake? Looks like, the, yeah, back in the very beginning of your presentation, you talked about using live stakes for the, to mitigate the erosion. Yeah, so live stakes are basically just dormant cuttings. Um, so those are typically species that are very easy to root as dormant cuttings. So, um, you know, a lot of our salix or willow species as well as some shrub dogwoods. So we maintain some in-ground beds of those species and they basically get cut back to two or three inches above ground every year. And then those straight shoots are then taken directly to planting sites and stuck right in the ground where they are able to you know, form roots on their own and quickly hold the soil and produce new plants. So you know, it's a, an evolutionary trait that those species have that allow them to root so easily under challenging conditions. And so we're just yeah, exploiting that. It's a pretty standard practice in the restoration trade, especially in riparian areas. Oh, OK. That's awesome. I, I was not familiar with that. I was going to ask if you made that up. <laughs> no, I did not. Yeah, it's a, it's a great asset. It's a quick way to get a lot of plants in the ground and, and hold soil, especially when you're reshaping um, you know, stream corridors. You can very quickly get woody plants established with minimal input. And it's a great for you know volunteers too because it, it doesn't require a lot of skill to install. Right, or making sure you keep certain species to get you, but you want a nice mix, I imagine. Yeah. And it, are you, I'm sure you mentioned this. Um, what is the time of year that you're typically doing that? So we're doing that right now. Um, you know, you want to harvest before bud break. Obviously, you want um, you want to get the, the stems while they're still dormant, and then basically as soon as the ground is soft enough that you can get them in. Um, you know, you really only need one node below the soil line to form roots, but you know, uh, generally the stakes that we cut are 36 inches. Um, we've done much larger ones for bigger scale projects, um, but typically they're like quarter inch to three quarter inch stakes, three feet long. And then we try and get them like two thirds of the way in the ground if possible, just to make sure that they're, they're in soils that are consistently moist. Awesome, that's very cool practice. Um, I actually was curious about your um, wild collecting and that was near and dear to my heart to see standing in the back of the truck and <laughs> getting to the seat and saying how perfect that is when it happens. And so um, are you ever in competition with you know other local nurseries out there that I know are restoration nurseries that are collecting seed I mean, we've never you know, like out in the field. Right, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like fighting it out, seeds. grab your live stakes. <laughs> no, that's, that's never happened, fortunately. Um, I mean, we're, you know, a pretty small scale operation. So our collections are, are pretty limited in capacity. So we're not really taking large volumes from, from anywhere. Um, and I think that's part of one of the reasons that um, other landowners are so willing to grant us permission to collect is that it's not only is it pretty small scale, but also all of our plants are, are for public land use, you know, they're not being sold or anything like that. So um, yeah, fortunately that's not been a problem. And, uh, you know, we're always trying to develop relationships with other growers, public and private, you know, um, I'm not always able to collect everything that I want to be growing and vice versa. So I'm always happy to share seeds and trade seeds with anyone that's interested. Awesome. Um, and I know you went into the proper permitting process, which as a, you know, wild, from a wild collected organization, I, I definitely feel the need to mention again that, you know, it's really important. It's illegal to go onto, you know, state property and public property for that matter too. No, <laughs> um, state property and just start collecting. And, you know, there is that permitting process and you have a protocol, you know, for the amount that you're collecting. Can you talk about that, you know, just briefly? Yeah, I mean, it's different for each organization, you know, some permits are fairly general where we'll just, um, you know, submit a target species list and sort of a broad outline of, of what we're trying to do, kind of like the maximum number we would collect, whereas other organizations want you to be a little more specific and we would say like, all right, we're going to go to this spot on the map and there are these 30 plants and we're going to collect, you know, no more than 1000 seeds from this population. So it kind of depends on the organization. Um, and then if it's any species that has any kind of state designation, rare or endangered, that obviously requires a little bit more um, permitting and you're going to have to submit some more detailed project plans for something like that. Great. Awesome. Thank you.
Sure. Yeah, it's always worthwhile collecting, making sure you know you're leaving some for nature, uh, for reseeding, uh, to keep your populations there, and and for animals and such. So just wanted to mention that as well. Um, you said you have this target list of your 170 or so odd species, and you know you're happy if you get 75 a year, which is quite substantial for wild collecting for sure. Um, do you have um, like your like your bulk 50 that you're collecting every year of the same ones, and then you hit the, you know, maybe you've got another species that you experiment more with um, and what you can collect, like, hey, we didn't get this species the last like three years. We definitely need to get that this year. Yeah, there are definitely regular performers um, and things we can count on, especially, um, you know, probably somewhere in that ballpark. And we're not collecting from all of those species every year. We always try to collect enough so that we can, you know, use some fresh and then also put some in storage just because, I mean, a lot of these plants don't produce regularly. A lot of them are cyclical in their seed production. So you can't count on them every year. Also just the timing of like getting to all of these locations every year is not really feasible. So um, I am always trying to establish stuff, you know, Basically, we'll, we'll wild collect seed, propagate a number of plants, and then try and set aside a number of those resulting plants to install either at the nursery itself or, you know, tracking where they go in the landscape. So, you know, obviously the, they're going to mix in with other plants and those genetics are going to be altered from that point going forward, but having a, a little bit more local source that like, all right, maybe I don't have time to run out and get that spirea or whatever, but I've got some on site here. I'll collect from those plants and and just have that in our back pocket. Yeah, right on. That makes sense. I know I I tend to hold on to to everything now, you know. <laughs> so there's don't have time to get that or that. It's like you said, and I feel like I don't know if you've seen this in um the past two years, I want to say specifically, the the amount of seed that I don't see being formed in the fall from species that I would continually see. That were like okay that i can definitely use that for like the class i'm teaching every year because it's mm. a performer and i can have you know all of the attendees you know get experience in collecting and for the last two years just hasn't been around and i'm wondering if you're seeing fluctuations in the amount of seed and from specific species uh, the past few years yeah i would say definitely this past fall was challenging i mean um, it was an off year for the oaks and hickories for us, which are yeah. some of our, you know, main, you know, backbone species. I mean, those are definitely cyclical in normal times. Um, and so the year before that was a pretty heavy mast year. So it wasn't surprising that those were lower producers. Though I will say that, like, I definitely have concerns about, um, you know, changes in weather patterns are going to affect these species phenology. And so losing that synchrony between pollinators and the species they're pollinating and also you know species that flower early in the season if they get hit with a late frost that can you know doom your seed crop for that year or the following year so um i you know while i love seed collecting and enjoy that process it's definitely um it's difficult to rely on that and if there were a commercial operation that could sell us seeds of appropriate origin i would gladly you know purchase that stuff to take some of the burden and the risk out of the seed collection process. But I mean, you know, fortunately we have some adaptability. So if, you know, we miss a seed crop or something like that, it's, it's um, not a major deal. We can always follow up on those project sites and get those species in later or make species substitutions. But yeah, I imagine it's only gonna get more challenging. Yeah, for sure. Um, Dan, are you, I know that we had chatted earlier this year about some seed sources and I was curious, are you able to collect from anything on property that you have? Do you have any stock areas? I know you went into that a little bit and I didn't know if you do any wild collecting locally or not. Hmm. I haven't done any wild collecting locally. Um, for the gardens themselves, the, uh, well, the botanical garden, um, every season, the annuals and the perennials that are growing on in that area, they're collected. Um, but I would like to expand that. Max, we should talk about this. Um, are you are you able to grow like for your annual like display? Are you able to grow all of that on site? No. Um, some of the material that we we purchase in 
um, plugs and then grow mm -hmm. that on from New Moon or Octoraro. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wish we don't have an incredible amount of growing space. Um, there's not much lay down area. And in an area that's also so urbanized with lots of invasives, well, I don't even, I don't like the word invasive, but those aggressive plants that came from overseas. Um, there you go. <laughs> yeah, uh, they, I guess they make some things challenging uh, when it comes to like reseeding in our pots and uh, all that jazz. Um, mm -hmm. So don't have a site yet, but I think we should. Um, so we can kind of propagate more. Uh, right now we just have one overwintering structure, a greenhouse and a concrete pad, which can get really hot, which we're hoping to shade that out a little bit more. Yeah, um, we have some new shade areas where we're like, okay, we need, we need shade here. We got to make this happen. And it's amazing, you know, when you can get um, somebody, somebody on site that has any type of uh, mechanical background. <laughs> like, okay, this is safe. It's going to stay up. It's not going to fall down. And we got shade. Doesn't matter what it looks like. <laughs> Just make yeah. it happen. So I get that. Um, are there any projects that you're working on right now or, or see that you've got in production that you're especially excited about? Hmm. We have some wild grapes that um, I'm kind of excited about. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe maybe some people might not be excited about these wild species, but they are in documentation from um, the Bartram period. And I guess Katie po pointed this out and we got them, I forget which, from what reservoir, um, I can maybe find that later from where I source them. Um, but those, those I'm pretty ex excited about, um, these wild grapes. As I think they're related to ironclad as the cultivar. Yeah, that sounds awesome. Um, is there an orchard still on site? Or there, there was an orchard being, I believe being installed maybe 10 years ago, I wanna say. Is that affiliated with Bartrams or the other end of the property? Yeah, Bartrams is 45 acres and that includes the orchard, the community farm. Yeah, okay. All, all that stuff. Um, so the orchard, uh, I think pop comes a lot. So Philly, Philadelphia Orchard Project does a lot of that management in, I think, partnership with Sankofa. So they do programming there to get people more engaged about growing food crops on their land. So that is that is on site and I definitely check it out. Yeah, for anyone who's not familiar with Bartrams, it's definitely, it, it's good, it's a destination to go to. It's a neat part of the city as Dan was explaining about having the a refinery, you know, across the river, and just to imagine what it must have been like, you know, to to be, in, you know, back when John Bartram, you know, first started planting things on the property, and when the Native, you know, um, Americans were here planting, and yeah, it's just it's phenomenal, and the part of the city that it's in, it is such an integral, you know, green space in that community. Yes, it's critical. Um, yeah, have that space. Let me see. I have, to, I have way more questions, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna hang on and keep asking questions, and so until nobody's left or you guys tell me you have to go. Uh, and so, but we still have you know Q and A open and the chat open. So if anyone thinks of anything as as we're talking, you know, please chime in. Um, I've got I've got more questions for Max if you're if you're still hanging on. Um, let's see, you were you were talking about using a hygrometer to measure moisture level in seed and humidity, and that you can then store them longer. And you were able to store even seed which you know might be recalcitrant or be really sensitive to over drying. And when you mentioned storing that. You know, recalcitrant seed. What, what what kind of length can you get out of that, and specifically which ones? Yeah, so um, we're not really storing recalcit recalcitrant seeds for that long. It's um, I was mostly just talking about making sure that they don't, because those seeds are intolerant of drying, making sure that they're at a moisture level that they'll remain viable, so that we're not you know letting them dry too much to minimize their viability. So right on. Um, 
yeah, we're, we're not really, we'll occasionally store some of that stuff, try and get, you know, two years out of it, collect in the fall and hold it for a whole year in the fridge. And sometimes that's, that'll work. You'll get some, some radical emergence in the fridge, but sometimes that's not necessarily an issue and things will still grow the following season. Um, but yeah, it's, it's mainly for making sure that things that can handle desiccation are dried down enough that they can be, yeah, sealed up and stashed away for a couple of years at least. Okay, I get a copy. But even even storing something with you know needing that moisture level for a year is 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 really admirable. So yeah, yeah, it's helpful, and it's um, you know you can soak the seed, or you know if it's fresh, make sure that it has that necessary moisture content, and then remove as much of the surface moisture from the seed, which will mm -hmm. kind of slow any germination that'll happen in the fridge. So um, that also can be useful in the like propagation phase where we'll, we'll soak seed for 48 hours or something like that to prep it for a cold period. And then really quickly remove the soy surface moisture which is with a fan or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that'll allow it to go through that dormancy breaking process. You know, it's, it's starting those physiological changes but it doesn't have enough moisture to actually germinate. So it's really priming the seed to then as soon as it gets sown in the greenhouse to really just like very quickly and very evenly germinate um, without getting too much um, radical emergence in the fridge. It also minimizes some of the mold growth that can happen in, in that cold storage as well sometimes. That's, that's actually really interesting because I definitely have done, you know, like different species, you know, will soak mm -hmm. and then give it the chilling period, but I hadn't thought as much about making sure you know, using a small fan, which we definitely use for seed cleaning that I'm like, oh yeah, that'd be perfect to use. Um, just to get that excess moisture because it's man, moisture is your, is your enemy, <laughs> a yeah. friend and your enemy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I know there's um, like some of the larger European nurseries, there are some species where they can even satisfy, you know, soak and satisfy that pre-tilling requirement and then dry again to a certain wow. level and store the seed so that it's like primed for rapid germination that they can store it then for years. And then it's already had that dormancy met. I know that some of the, I think European beach, you can do that with. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's that's, all kinds of crazy cool stuff you can do with. That's really interesting. Actually, um, yeah. I was just talking with um, someone from IPPS, um, Piso Native Plant Nursery. Um, out in Illinois, and they grow a ton of carex species and different grasses. Um, you know, and they they're able to hold them in a in a, a chilling, like actually a cool, moist stratification for you know a year or even more, and then able to pull it out when they need it. And they're having like super amazing success with that. Oh, that's interesting. I know. I was like, I, this is see, this is what's awesome about IPPS. You get these little nuggets that you can't find anywhere else. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you mentioned you're putting, you know, your seed in the cooler with a sand. Um, I, I think you mentioned the specific type of sand. I've gone back and forth between using sand, you know, using paper towels, using uh, fine vermiculite. Um, it, and now it's basically like, you know, depending on which seed it is. Um, but I'm curious what sand you're using. It's just a like all purpose sand from the hardware store. It's nothing fancy. Yeah. Like the, 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 is it the play safe sand or are you using more like a contractor's? It's a little coarser than play yeah. sand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I find that it's one of the reasons to use that apart from making it easy to separate the seed from the media is that it's also difficult to add too much water to sand like vermiculite and peat moss. Yeah. It's, you can add too much water, but with sand, it, like it'll kind of only hold so much. And so uh, it takes a little bit of the guesswork out of it. Same with, I know that like Shelly Dillard from the Morris uses perlite for that fact. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah, kind of a check on adding too much water to the mix. Yeah, I always, um, if we're doing a huge sewing project, we'll pre-moisten, you know, our vermiculite so that it's like, okay, this is what we want. Mm -hmm. versus, oh, I'm only sewing this small number today. I'm going to use a squirt bottle and just make sure I get the amount of moisture in there that I want. Um, and, you know, sometimes you win and sometimes not if you're in too much of a hurry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, oh, that's okay. And are you propagating, this is actually a question for both of you, and are you propagating year round? Like, uh, do you have yeah. winter facilities where you're doing any winter cuttings or like when's, when are you starting? Like I imagine you're in full swing starting now or soon. 
yeah, soon. I mean, our facilities are, are you know, not uh, sophisticated enough that I would push the seasons too much. I also try to get, you know, these, a lot of the species we grow, I find like, um, you know, it's better to get them outside into the elements as quickly yeah. as possible. So I don't want them in the greenhouse that long. Um, so yeah, we generally will start sowing seed in the next couple of weeks. We're starting to pot up larger plants right now. Um, and then we will do a little bit of like, if we miss a seed crop or something, occasionally we'll stick some cuttings, but the bulk of our work is yeah, spring sown seed. And um, yeah, Dan, I don't know what, what you guys have going, if you're up and running yet. Yeah, we are up and running. Uh, the greenhouse is filling up with annuals and some perennials. Um, started stratifying earlier this year for some of the crops um, in our refrigerators. But as far as, I guess I wouldn't say all year round, um, definitely starting from like January through um, May, June, then it kind of just gets too hot in our greenhouse and that's, we're not propagating in there anymore, but doing some cuttings and propagation outside later in the season for fall. Um, yeah, but we only have so much space. Yeah, right on. Um, are you 